Good afternoon, and welcome to the panel session on the future of finance. My name is Ajay Patel. I'm a professor of finance at the School of Business at Wake Forest University. And it is my pleasure to be moderating this session that includes three well-known individuals in their respective fields to give us their thoughts on the issue. To provide some background on the session, we know that the financial crisis is in our rearview mirror, but its effects continue to linger on. We're still trying to sort out what should have been done in response to the crisis, and we continue to sort through what should be done now to prevent a repeat. This session, featuring three of the leading voices in practice and academia, will address what the future holds for finance and the profession of finance. What has changed? What should change? What is the way forward, given what we know about the crisis, its causes, and its aftermath? Our first panelist is Andrew Caroli on my left. Andrew very graciously agreed to fill in for Dr. Laura Starks, who had to cancel her trip at the last minute due to an illness. Andrew is the alumni professor in asset management and professor of finance at the Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell University. He is an internationally known scholar in the area of investment management with a specialization in the study of international financial markets. He has published extensively in finance and economics journals, including the Journal of Finance, the Journal of Financial Economics, and the Review of Financial Studies, and has published several books and monographs. His research has been covered extensively in print and electronic media, including the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, The Economist, Time, New York Times, Washington Post, Forbes, Business Week, and CNBC. Andrew currently serves as executive editor of the Review of Financial Studies, one of the top tier, uh, though Andrew would like me to say general interest journals in finance. He is and has also served as an associate editor for a variety of journals, including the Journal of Finance, the Journal of Financial Economics, Journal of Empirical Finance, Journal of Banking and Finance, Review of Finance, and the Pacific Basin Finance Journal. He's the recipient of the Fama DFA Prize for Capital Markets and Asset Pricing in 2005, the William F. Sharp Award for Scholarship in Finance 2001, and the Journal of Empirical Finance's Biennial Best Paper Prize in 2006, the Fisher College of Business's Pace Setter Awards for Excellence in Research and Graduate Teaching, and Johnson's Prize for Excellence in Research in 2010. He joined Johnson in 2009 after teaching for 19 years at the Fisher College of Business of The Ohio State University. He leads various executive education programs in the US, Canada, Europe, and Asia, and is actively involved in consulting with corporations, banks, investment firms, stock exchanges, and law firms. He currently chairs the Board of Trustees and is past president of the Financial Management Association International and has served as a director of the American Finance Association. Our second panelist is Neil Gauvier. Neil is the head of education in the Asia Pacific region for the CFA Institute. Neil leads regional efforts to increase educational opportunities and content for CFA Institute members and the finance community and promote the CFA, CIPM, and Claritas programs. He's also responsible for developing and managing university relationships in Asia Pacific. He has been in the training world for more than 15 years, teaching across a wide range of subjects, including the CFA program and the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, credential, as well as designing and, de and delivering bespoke courses for a variety of investment management and banking clients. He has taught in North America, Europe, the Middle East and Asia. Prior to joining CFA Institute, he was managing director for Asia Pacific of Fitch Seven City Learning, where he oversaw the strategy, business development, operations and course delivery for the region from Singapore. He is a member of the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment, a fellow of ICAEW, and a CFA charter holder. Our third panelist is Suk Hyun. He is a research fellow at Korea Capital Market Institute and concurrently 
a director of Center for Global Financial Collaboration of KCMI. He also serves as a secretariat representing Korea in the ASEAN Plus Three Bond Market Forum, an appointment made by the Ministry of Strategy and Finance in Korea. He is a founding member of the Capital Market Association of Asia and a visiting research fellow at Waseda University in Japan since 2007. Before that, he worked as an economist with the Bank of Korea for a year, conducting research on Korean flows of funds system, and for three years in Japan as a bond market specialist in charge of Asian bond market initiatives, task force at Japan Bank for International Cooperation, which is the export credit agency of the Japanese government. His recent research areas include the internationalization of Asian currencies in developing Asian bond markets, cross-border use of currency and volatility of exchange rates, and establishment of regional settlement intermediary in Asian capital market development and integration. Let's turn to the crisis now. In 2007, the housing crisis worsened and banks and hedge funds that invested heavily in subprime mortgage, mortgages were left holding assets whose value had declined substantially. Freddie Mac stated in February 2007 that they would no longer purchase the most risky subprime loans. In April, New Century Financial, a subprime mortgage lender, filed for bankruptcy court protection. In August, American Home Mortgage Investment, with specialized in adjustable rate mortgages, filed for bankruptcy protection. In 2008, the US economy was in recession and the subprime mortgage crisis infected the credit markets. In January of 2008, Bank of America agreed to buy Countrywide Financial for about $4 billion. In March, the Federal Reserve agreed to guarantee $30 billion of Bear Stearns assets in connection with the government-sponsored sale of investment bank to J.P. Morgan Chase. In July, IndyMac Federal Bank became the largest regulated thrift to fail. By September, mortgage giants Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae were taken over by the government. On September 15th, Bank of America agreed to purchase Merrill Lynch for $50 billion. Also that day, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy court protection. On the 16th, AIG accepted an $85 billion federal bailout that gave the bank a 79, gave the government a 79.9% stake in the company. On the 21st, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley filed to become bank holding companies. On the 25th, federal regulators closed Washington Mutual Bank and its branches, and assets were sold, sold to J.P. Morgan Chase. On October 3rd, Congress passed a revised version of TARP, and Wells Fargo agreed to acquire Wachovia for about $14.8 billion. On November 23rd, Citigroup was rescued with a package of guarantees, funding access, and capital. Citi issued preferred shares to the Treasury and FDIC in exchange for protection against losses on a $360 billion pool of commercial and residential securities it held. And then on December 19th, the US Treasury authorized loans of up to $13.4 billion for GM and $4 billion for Chrysler from TARP. All of us can recall these events as they unfolded in 2007 and 2008. We are also aware of the many reasons given for these events. Individuals were said to have been over leveraged with the greatest leverage increase occurring for middle income borrowers. Over eager lenders and financial institutions chasing yield added to the problem. Governments, central banks, regulators and legislatures played a role by keeping interest rates low, by allowing leverage to increase dramatically, by allowing government sponsored enterprises to operate at an inadequate level of capitalization and by exempting OTC derivatives from regulation. The rating agencies played an important role in facilitating the leverage boom and to some extent non-financial businesses saw their leverage increase as well. Now the finance industry's failures have continued subsequent to the financial crisis. The banking sector has had its share of scandals ranging from allegations of trading scams and money laundering to manipulating LIBOR and foreign exchange rates, among others. On the non-financial corporate side, the post-crisis period has seen its share of changes as well. The administration in Washington and the press have focused their efforts on several issues, among them calling on U.S. non-financial firms 
to reduce their holdings of cash. They've also focused on executive pay and on decreasing the pay gap between the average worker and the CEO. Some activist investors in hedge funds have focused their efforts on getting firms to disgorge themselves of the over 1.7 trillion in cash held by US non-financial firms by pushing for changes in payout policy. They've also taken an active role in shaping corporate governance by trying to get firms to change their business model by busting up the firm or by getting them to divest assets. On the security market side, changes are underway in how markets are regulated, where and how trades occur, among other changes. So we seem to have some sense of why the crisis happened and are aware of all that has happened in the industry subsequent to the crisis. So this seems to be an opportune time to turn to what we have learned from the crisis, what has changed, what should change, and what the future holds for finance and the finance procession, profession. To turn to these issues, I've asked each of the panelists to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, 15 to 17 minutes, following which we will open up the floor for questions from the audience. So to start, Andrew, let's turn to you for your thoughts on the issue. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you here. Uh, it's been, it's an honor to have been asked to uh, step into this role for, for, uh, for the panel and for my colleague, Laura Starks. And uh, so I want to thank Ajay uh, for this kind invitation. And I look forward to uh, hearing the remarks of my fellow panelists uh, as well. Um, so uh, I took the lead from the prompt of my moderator, uh, Ajay, to think, and the theme, I would say, from the conference uh, that we have uh, promoted here uh, in terms of thinking about the future of finance, but, but from the perspective of the global financial crisis that is very fresh in the rearview mirror, as Ajay just said. And, uh, and I thought his summary was, was, was uh, excellent. So one year after the financial crisis ended in 2010, um, the Wall Street Journal was running a story with a journalist uh, lead uh, on, the, on the story who was reaching out to faculty members at a number of schools around the country, the United States, uh, which is where I'm based, uh, and was asking instructors, said instructors, who happened to have responsibility for teaching MBA and executive MBA courses, core finance courses, as I was, um, what exactly do you teach differently now that we have just experienced uh, this crisis? And um, it was not an easy question to answer. Uh, I took the easy road out of the, uh, of the uh, interview, and uh, as many of my academic colleagues would naturally do, turned to the research that I'm doing at that moment in time uh, and talked a lot about um, liquidity risks, uh, liquidity risks, funding constraints of financial intermediaries, hedge funds, proprietary trading desks, uh, and various other types of intermediaries and trying to rationalize how that might have contributed to the liquidity pressures that we experienced during the financial crisis. I felt pretty good about myself uh, in coming up with that answer on the fly, saying that this was something that we were more prominently uh, including in our curriculum. Uh, and, and, uh, and they wrote it down and featured it in the story. Now, I'll be honest with you, I felt like I was put on the defensive. Um, with a very, uh, within, you know, within one year, uh, that's not a lot of time to have thought through uh, in a sort of a sober, sensible way what the potential consequences would be. Um, so it was a little bit unfair. Uh, so what I decided to do was uh, recognize that, well, within about five years of the, uh, keep, going? keep going? Okay, thank you very much. So um, 
about five years after the global financial crisis, I'm sure you read a myriad of review articles in the popular press about uh, now that we're at the five year anniversary mark, all the things that we'll have learned. Um, and, uh, and of course, we are now two years later than that. Uh, so uh, I wondered if uh, it might be appropriate time to calibrate this. So one of the things I did uh, in preparation for this is I actually went to our good old friend Google. And I went to Google and I did a simple search called lessons from the dot, dot, dot <laughs> as my uh, keyword search. I defined purposefully uh, a custom range um, for, uh, for the five year anniversary. But I knew that those numbers, and I'm going to tell you what those numbers say in a second, wouldn't mean very much without some kind of calibration. So where in the world could we go to possibly find some other crisis event and a post-crisis uh, debrief to calibrate against the global financial crisis of 2008 to see if we're learning in turn from there or measure the extent of the learning that is happening or not. So obviously for my first instance, I turn naturally, being sitting here in Seoul, Korea, to the Asian financial crisis of 1997. Some of you in this room may very well remember uh, the intensity of that experience that was very much felt here in Korea. And, uh, and so here's what I did. So I took the five-year horizon after July 1st of 1997, which was the first day of the major decline of the Thai bot that was the precipice of the Asian financial crisis that propagated throughout this region. And I tracked all stories that referred to lessons from the Asian financial crisis and tracked that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to report to you that there were 20,300 hits on that search. Uh, and of course, I'm sure you want to know that it took 0 0.3 sec, 0 0.36 seconds uh, to dump and count those, those hits. So now the question is calibrating that. OK, so now what would you imagine would be the similar equivalent count for that same five-year custom range starting in the Im immediate aftermath of, uh, of the global financial crisis. So I started my search, customized it around the fall of Lehman, October 16, 2008, and I traced that out five years. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to report that that search only took 0.31 seconds, uh, and it delivered 1.57 a bill, a million, excuse me, 1.57 million stories. Uh, so uh, clearly the intensity of the learning or the debriefing of the aftermath was quite clearly uh, greater than that. Now so, since we're at an academic conference, I thought we might want to do a calibration of the equivalent experiment uh, in turn for academic research. So where would we go for academic research to see how much learning is taking place in the immediate aftermath? The Social Sciences Research Network allows for a nice custom range evaluation, equivalent five-year, five-year uh, comparison, ladies and gentlemen, in the immediate aftermath of the Asian financial crisis, there were 151 postings with the title of Asian financial crisis in the SSRN. In the aftermath, five-year aftermath of the global financial crisis, we're at 1,269. These are not close. The dimensions of the intensity of the attention that's being devoted to the global financial crisis far outweighs that which we experience uh, with respect to the Asian financial crisis. Now these are just numbers, they don't mean very much. It's hard to really read into them and understand them. So another way to go would be to try to evaluate the di dimension of learning for the future of finance qualitatively as opposed to quantitatively. Uh, so I thought I tried to think of the most controversial touch point in this aftermath that might lead us to somewhere where we could evaluate uh, this. Uh, I don't agree with the views of this person uh, for the most part, uh, but I recognize him as somebody who is very articulate and writes beautifully. Uh, this is a gentleman by the name of Justin Fox. 
Uh, he is a former editor of Fortune magazine, economics editor of Fortune magazine, uh, former editor and contributor at the Harvard Business Review, and currently at Bloomberg. And um, he wrote a well, a very successful book entitled The Myth of the Rational Market, which took a very hard-hitting view at the whole sort of concept, uh, the arcane concept in his view of the rationality of markets. Much of what we teach when we teach in our, in our courses. Uh, and he wrote a, a, a five-year anniversary piece called uh, What We've Learned from the Financial Crisis. Uh, that's November 2013, Harvard Business Review. I encourage you to go read it. He makes three points of the learnings, okay? And I'm going to offer my own editorial view on what he views as the learnings, okay? So learning number one, okay? And then I'll sit down and hand off the panel to the next. Uh, to the next. Uh, lesson number one in uh, Mr. Fox's uh, view is that macroeconomics discovers finance. And I think he meant to say, finally. Uh, so his argument starts by describing the history of economic thought through much of the 20th century um, and leads up to a general discussion about the New Keynesians and how much of New Keynesian thought was factoring in a lot of market, a lot of frictions, but the frictions often focused disproportionately on the real sectors and the labor markets, typically with respect to wages uh, and the tendency of prices and wages to be uh, sticky. He talks extensively in a disparaging way, I would offer, uh, about uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models that are so popular in macroeconomics research, which he says are populated by these rational uh, individuals. And, um, uh, and what he mentions in this argument about macroeconomics finally waking up to the importance of finance is a number of scholars, he argues, that were studying on the periphery of mainstream macroeconomics, the importance of things like liquidity evaporation in capital markets, collateral shortages, bubbles, crises, panics, fire sales in the asset management world, risk shifting, contagion, uh, and he celebrates the fact that in the last five years, a number of articles have been written and popularized by some of our leading scholars. He mentions some names, um, uh, colleagues of our good friend Jose Shankman, who just spoke, uh, Marcus Brunemeyer, and celebrating his work about finally uh, taking this attention that was once on the periphery into the mainstream of macroeconomic research. So I read this and I go, huh. I seem to recall many papers being written about Capital sho uh, collateral shortages about crises and panics and, uh, and uh, uh, fire sales and contagion. In fact, I seem to recall writing a few of those myself in the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis. So I must say, I, I somewhat challenge uh, this perspective that somehow the field of macroeconomics finally woke up to understand the importance of financial markets. I believe they've been, they've well understood the importance of financial markets uh, for, for many, many decades uh, uh, before that. Point number two, big headline, finance gets back to the big picture. And I guess he probably again wanted to say, finally, exclamation mark. Uh, he writes beautifully uh, about the history of financial thought Obviously, much of this was featured prominently in his book uh, on the myth of the rational market. Um, and he talks about especially the important and noteworthy rise of the importance of behavioral models in finance during the 1990s and 2000s, celebrating that. But again, arguing in a parallel way with his criticism of macroeconomics was that much of this was still quite on the periphery of finance. And he points to a catalyst event, uh, and I don't fault him for doing this, uh, recognizing the important event of Raghu Rajan, the, at that time, chief economist of the IMF, now 
uh, the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, and his celebrated speech at the Jackson Hole Symposium of Central Bankers in 2005, emphasizing to this audience of central bankers the importance of liquidity crises, fire sales, and just that this idea that the financial markets are naturally prone to instability and that it has these broader ripple effects for the real sector and the economy at large. And he talked a lot about the expanded role of the financial sector and the potential debilitating aspects of the greater risk taking in the financial sector that is embodied in there. A lot of discussion about systemic risks sort of got into our common vernacular. And of course out of this, as your introductory remarks, Ajay, pointed out, this is really around which this whole big push for macroprudential regulation and re-regulation of the banking and financial sectors of the around the world was really at its, uh, at its forefront. Uh, and of course led in the United States, for example, to uh, intensive re-regulation through the Dodd-Frank Act uh, of 2012, which had uh, an omnibus bill that had many title acts that were dealing with trying to rein in some of these risk-taking incentives in the financial sector. Now I sit here and I say, well, I, I, I recognize the importance of the words of my friend Raghu Rajan, but I believe that honestly finance, I, I'm not even sure that behavioral finance really was at the periphery uh, and on the outside of things and I think that we well understood some of the importance of the size of a financial sector and its being prone to instability and the potential consequences of it. Uh, I don't think that this was a revelation that came in the late 2000s in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Number three, a big headline point. Economists start losing control of the corporation. And in this sub-essay of his article, he talks about the fact that, you know, uh, to, uh, for many, many years, the neoclassical perspective was about managers of the firm maximizing shareholder value. And he mentions as an important catalyst in this sort of boundaries of the firm understanding of, of, of uh, corporate finance, the importance of recognizing agency problems, the importance of agency problems, and the work of Jensen and Meckling. And, uh, and, and its potential consequences for our understanding about, of, of, of managerial uh, incentives and the potential for that going awry in terms of uh, not only the financial sector but more corporate interests more broadly. And he mentions near the end of this section that it's pretty clear that the most dramatic, this is almost a quote, a paraphrase, most dramatic empirical finding in the aftermath uh, of the financial crisis is that banks and investment banks um, that got in the worst trouble were those with the most shareholder friendly executive pay and governance provisions. And finally we've come to the realization about this. So, now I, I happen to think that we were probably doing a lot of research in finance looking at managerial incentives the distortions that can, can come from that, that the antecedents of it and the potential consequences of it within financial institutions and without for many, many years before some of this most recent evidence. Uh, so to me, ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing in these arguments that lead me to question the importance of a healthy, vibrant, vital, financial market and uh, for, for a sustainable and viable economy. Uh, and to me, uh, you know, we, we'll discuss the future of finance and the learnings thereof, but I, I think the future is just fine. Thank you, Andrew. Our next panelist, Neil. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, and thank you, AJ, for the introduction. And uh, when AJ was simply introducing the panelists, uh, there were lots of nice words used, but there were three words that were used for the other two panelists, but not for myself. Uh, one is scholar, the other is academic, and the third one was research. 
Uh, and that is because I am neither or I, I'm not any of those three. Uh, and so I realize I stand here in pretty august um, with people around me here. Uh, but I come from a, a different area. So I come from a, a training background. I now work with the, the CFA Institute. And when I was invited, and thank you very much for the invitation to come along and speak today, um, I was told, oh, don't go on about the CFA Institute. You know, nobody wants to hear about that. But to be honest with you, I just have to mention that because it does frame the comments I'm going to make. Okay, so, you know, we, we must just touch on that. Uh, but as we go forward, and this is basically sort of the shape of uh, my 15, uh, 17 minutes. Uh, so I am going to mention a little bit about the CFA Institute so you realize where my comments are coming from. Uh, and then I'm going to look at the state of the industry. Uh, Andrew just left it saying it was very, very healthy, uh, and uh, we all know there's a place for a robust investment management industry. Uh, but I'm going to sort of maybe say a few things, a uh, few things which we see going forward, and maybe what the future holds from us as a member organization. Uh, looking at the state of the industry, it's going to be summed up in those two words, growing, and I've got some numbers, uh, and disruption. And in that, that is a disruption from our point of view from our member organization. And having highlighted uh, a couple of the issues that we see at the moment, uh, bearing in mind uh, this panel session is the future of finance, uh, it is incumbent upon me to say, what are we going to do about the future and our role that we are playing? And so, uh, breaking the rules, uh, just introducing the CFA Institute, just very mildly, I think it is incumbent upon me just to say, uh, we are a member institution as I did just mention at lunch. Uh, the mission is to lead the professional, the investment profession globally by promoting the highest standards of ethics, education, and professional excellence. So that's what we stand for. And when we look at the future of finance, we are thinking of it very much from a member organization. Now you have six letters in blue at the end for the ultimate benefit of society. Those were added after the well-documented crisis that AJ referred to. Because where we are coming from is that the investment community has to add value and has to be trusted by the individuals who allocate their funds to mutuals maybe, uh, the pension companies who maybe give out mandates. But it has to work for the ultimate benefit of society. So we just added those words there. And that's all I'm gonna say about the CFE Institute here. But let's have a look at the industry. As I said, I think it can be summed up in two words, growing with disruption. And so coming to the growing part, and I'm sort of representing the investment industry, which obviously looks after and invests money on behalf of their clients. Okay, a very important, important part, redistributing wealth, but importantly for an individual perspective, making sure that we can all retire and we get the pension uh, that we've deserved and we've had the right advice along the way. A couple of points just to pick up on the, the growth in the investment industry. Middle class, as you can see, it is suggested that by 2040, it'll be 180% bigger. And other research points to the fact that the decade between 2010 and 2020, there's going to be 1 billion extra, what we might call middle class. And those middle class, as we see around us, certainly in an emerging part of the, the world, uh, they will have additional money, they will want to start investing them for their children, their children's education, and for their own retirement. And that, of course, is central to our community. Along with the growth in middle class, of course, comes the high net worth individual. And for the purpose of this uh, presentation, this slide here, high net worth individual is taken to be uh, investable assets uh, of one million US dollars. And you can see simply from the visual the way that is going up. Uh, in the year 2012 to 2013, 14.7% uh, global increase in high net worth as defined. Uh, Asia Pacific, not surprising, uh, is leading that growth with a 17.3%. And there is nothing at all to suggest that that trend uh, globally and certainly in our part of the world, as I call Asia Pacific, is going to go away. And so what that represents again is increasing, if you like, a good sign, a very positive sign for the investment management community. Well, not surprisingly, with all this good news about, uh, there are a few uh, metrics here, if you like. Uh, there was a report earlier on this year 
which was saying, I think, for the first time that asset managers, fund managers, were earning more than investment bankers. And uh, I was around long enough in training to see the boom in investment banking uh, and to see what much recruitment led to subsequently. So a boom is very good as long as we have standards within the community. And uh, you know, if the, sort of the community needs additional people to manage this growth in assets, then those additional people have to be trained. And again, that's where we come in. But all the signs here are so positive. They're all really above their 2007, 2008, the 2008 lows. Okay, so if we look at assets under management per employee, wages per employee, revenue per employee, profitability per employee, things are looking very, very good. And that story continues. So all I'm really doing is saying how positive everything is. Assets under management. Forecast by 2020, only five years away now. 2020 used to seem well, well in the future, but it's almost around the corner. Investable assets or assets under management over 101 trillion US dollars. And you can see that growth trend. Whether it be under mutual funds or whether it be mandates, you can see that that growth is going to continue. So again, I'm painting a very, very rosy picture of the investment management community. But remember, sort of my talk was going to be about growing, very positive, and it's going to be about disruption. And disruption is actually shown here as well. Because rather than just sort of looking at the growth in asset management, what we can see when we've analyzed, and you can see it's been broken down between active and passive. And whether it be mutual funds or mandates, the percentages, you can do your own maths, uh, not math, as my American cousins would say, uh, you can do your own maths and you realize that the percentages are much the same. The percentage of assets under management that were passively managed uh, in 2004 comes to about 6%. By 2012, whether it was mutual or mandated, that's about 12 or 13%. And forecast by 2020, that's going to be nearer the 25, 26%. Now, for an association whose members are involved in active investment management, they're our core member and audience, this is now a big warning signal for us. So if we're looking at the health of the industry, we are looking at it from the health of, if you like, our members. And we can see this trend away from active management. We all read many, many reports about how if you take the average active manager, they underperform a mere passive or a tracker or an ETF fund. And maybe the more that is spoken about, whether it be true or not, and research can prove one thing or another, that's obviously the investing public are obviously saying we no longer have confidence in the active management. We talk all about the, the alphas and the active betas and all this sort of thing, but to be honest with you, we're not so sure they're doing what they say they're going to do. Also, although less um, notable, uh, the alternatives, the growth in alternatives uh, are also increasing and forecast to increase. And I think there's probably an issue there in the fact that we get more familiar with alternatives, but there's also the fact that I think you can bet invest in alternatives, whether it be direct in real estate or gold if you want to, whatever, you don't actually have to go and seek investment advice to make those type of alternative investments. So from our organization, we now start seeing the trend away from trust in our members. This slide just really adds on, okay, comes from a different source, so don't try and sort of match all the numbers up. Uh, that's not going to work, but you can see an absolute trend, again, in passive investing. This is looking at index equity uh, mutual funds. And as you can see, more and more money is going into their uh, ETFs, another story, but that's certainly a theme which we are seeing and which is of concern to us when we look into the future. Okay, so it depends upon what perspective you've got. Again, robo-investing. Okay, we're going to hear a lot more about these and you might recognize some of the names on the left-hand side of that slide. Uh, these are relatively new businesses they're attracting a lot of seed capital, a lot of investment money in. And the point about robo-investing, and you can see the numbers in the growth, 65% over this short period, 
Uh, it might not be statistical, but uh, you can see again a trend, a clear trend coming. And again, this is going to cut out the intermediary. This is going to cut out the person whose advice traditionally has been sought. And again, the concern to us is, are people saying, we don't need advice anymore. We're going to cut out the middleman. We're just going to find a way of doing this cheaply and do it on our own. Another element of disruption, uh, obviously following the 2008 crisis, we know that the regulators uh, have been very, very busy. Most of their focus in that time has been on the investment banks because they are the ones which uh, initially seemed to need the bailouts and got into trouble. But more recently, I think their eyes have lifted and they're now looking at the investment management community. And you can see a few stories here. There are stories of mis-selling, uh, whether it be you know, at the retail end, and uh, I'm in Hong Kong at the moment, but uh, before that I was in Singapore, and I was in Singapore for about seven years, and I landed uh, about six months before the Lehman mini bond fiasco hit, uh, if any of you can recall that. Basically, that was mis-selling at the retail end, selling structured products, which I'm not saying I'm a clever guy, but I could not understand the structure behind it, so how anybody else could. So there are these stories. You can also see from here as well, and it touches on the fees. Okay, we have a lot of so-called active managers who are charging for the skill they bring to their active management. And we know that many of them are little more than maybe closet trackers. And certainly in a good bull market, that's the easiest thing to do. Just follow the market and you can post some nice returns. Okay, and so again, we are aware that the regulators will be looking at the industry we represent a little bit more focused uh, as they sort of move through. So putting these ideas together, uh, we have some bad behavior uh, that could be mis-selling, unethical practices, and don't forget the CFA stands for ethical high standards. Uh, poor value proposition, and maybe this again is leading that drift away, the fees Okay, you know, the research I read says that uh, before fees, the average active manager might be doing better than a tracker, but after fees, they don't. And I think, we think as an organization, the public are questioning, where's the value for money here? How come you're all driving around in these very nice cars, and yet I'd have been better off if I'm, my money had been in a tracking fund? This is our concern. This is the threat to us. There's also this very, very narrow focus on quarter-on-quarter -quarter performance all the time. We advocate, and we're not the only ones here, about long-term commitment. If this is to make sure that I can retire one day and I can send my children to school, it's not about quarter-on-quarter -quarter performance. But being driven by this reduces maybe the, the role the active manager can play. It focuses them into maybe suboptimal activity. And I've been reading uh, research that Myron Scholes has been doing recently. Uh, in which he's saying that the actual mandate that is given to managers is actually restricting their ability to outperform. And one of those restrictions is, you know, a quarter-on-quarter -quarter review, which almost like ties the manager's hands together because they cannot relax that bit and take the longer term. So putting these together from an organization which is all about the ethics and the education, we see a loss of trust. And if those whose money we should be investing properly lose trust in us for whatever reason, we will see more regulatory intervention. We're already seeing people moving away, declining intermediation. They don't need us, maybe. They're just going to go into passive funds and maybe a switch into non-fee paying assets, assets where they don't have to get advice and therefore doesn't pay any fees to those there. On the loss of trust, because this is fairly central to us, okay, so this is a little bit gloomier maybe than, uh, Andrew, you might have highlighted a moment ago. Uh, we did a survey a couple of years ago uh, and just seen asking the general public, uh, where do you put uh, the financial, the world of finance, which is a fairly broad definition, but where do you put them? 52% uh, of correspondents said they would trust the world of finance. When probed a little bit further, about what is it? Why is the reason you're not trusting these who can help you build up your pension? The answer is, you can see the numbers stand out here unequivocally, a feeling that there's a lack of ethical culture. And so when we look into the future, 
we see a community who we should be trusted to manage basically taking that trust away from us and looking for alternative ways of investing, supported by the move to passiveness and these sorts of uh, research findings that we have here. So this is our concern. So what are we going to do about it? It's all right saying, wow, people don't seem to trust us anymore, or you know, regulators are going to get involved, but this is our response. Now, we are organized into three strategic functions within the CFA Institute. Okay? This isn't really important. One about developing future professionals, that's the curriculum. That's the robustness of the exam that allows you to put CFA after your name. Delivering member value. This is about getting firms to realize that the standard they should be employing, and if you are an asset owner and you are giving out a mandate, the question you should be asking is, how many CFA charter holders do you employ? Uh, building market integrity is about building our relationship with uh, other professional organizations, but of course very closely with the regulators and getting them to listen to us, working with them, and in that way, they needn't sort of come in and sort of take over the role of regulation. They can see that we are an organization and our members will support that. But I just want to touch on the word professional for a minute. We talk, I talk loosely about the finance industry. And I don't know if you know, but uh, the CFA Institute has recently had a new CEO, Paul Smith, who I'm lucky enough to work with because uh, he was the MD of Asia Pac, where I sit. And uh, Paul is absolutely passionate over this question. And if I was Paul, which I am for a moment now, I'd be saying industry sell and professions service. But we talk about the finance industry. And Paul, what's our long-term aim is to be recognized as a profession. And one of the things about being accepted as a profession is that, one, regulators say only members of that profession can do certain jobs, lawyers, doctors, okay, accountants. But more importantly, coming back to that question of trust, the public says, yeah, we trust you. We call you professional. So accountants, it's the accounting profession, isn't it? It's the legal profession. It is not the investment management profession. It is the investment management industry. And maybe that's part of the problem, going back to the quarter on quarter all the time. Okay? Maybe we've been seen as trying to sell things, not work in the best interests of those whose money we're actually managing. And so for us, that has to be a big switch. And when I say us, I'm coming from the point of view, obviously, of the CFA Institute. So, what are we going to do it? Develop future professionals, that's the program. You can go to our table outside. Uh, delivering member value and getting the trust back, we work hard on this. So we have things like code of ethics. We have the asset management code, and we want asset management firms to embrace our code. The global investment performance standards. Future of finance initiatives, which is a very nice segue into the title today. So under the future of finance, we see the biggest concern is lack of professionalism within our industry, and with that, mistrust from the, uh, those that, who should be trusting us, mistrust coupled with a big question mark over, are they getting value for money? Okay? So our future of finance is trying to address these concerns that we see. Um, there's, there's six there. And these didn't come out sort of like, you know, a five-minute chat. These came out of discussions uh, with academics, with those who are out there uh, doing the job, uh, the great and the good. And these were the six topics that we decided that we really had to focus on in order to make the future of our community slightly rosier. Uh, put an investor first. I'll just uh, quickly mention some of these just to give you an idea. Every May we have putting investor first month. But what this comes down to is actually getting the message over to investors the standards they should be accepting, the questions they should be asking. So if you went along to a doctor and said, I'm not feeling so well, you'd probably want to see a diploma of something on the wall. 
Okay? Otherwise, you just self-diagnose on Google. Okay? If you were to go along to your investment professional, you'd want to see something on the wall, say, yep, yeah, I'm the person for you. And the investment industry has a pretty low barrier of entry, to be honest. I can pass a regulatory exam, and in some countries, that is quite low, and I'm away. So we want it to be higher. We want everybody to say, where's your CFA certificate? I can't see it. I'm not going to trust you unless we have that. So that will get the trust back, we hope. There's a huge education gap. And as I go around and I talk to uh, partners, universities, I talk to industry regulators in the emerging markets, they're very concerned about the growth in the middle class, which is great, but the lack of educational, financial education that goes with it. And if there's that lack of trust, we have that problem. And so you can see there, uh, you know, three questions asked. When you get to the right-hand side, only 18% of people seem to even know how much you'd have in the bank after two years if you had a bit of compounding interest. And therefore, they must rely and have absolute trust in the person who is going to advise them about that. So we're working on closing the gap. Transparency and fairness, fees, fees are clearly an issue. The questions are being asked, what are you giving me for your money or for the fees I'm paying you? Okay? If I go into a solicitor's and say, will you help me, I'm moving house, I need to convey my house, they will say, how much fee do you charge? What is it? And they'll say, there it is, $400, fixed fee. So maybe we need to move away from a commission-driven situation more to a fee-driven and then I know what I'm getting, and you work in my interest. Regulation enforcement, as I've already said, if we don't self-regulate, uh, regulators will do it for us. The problem with regulation, the bad side, is people fight regulation, and they waste all their energy in not actually getting on and doing a good job, but trying to find ways around it. We support effective regulation, and we work closely with regulators. Safeguarding the system, through our conversations with organizations, with regulators, you can see here some great success stories. The Asset Management Code adopted by BlackRock, these are only examples, to Masek in Singapore, Prudential. We want our voice to be heard. And if we can get our voice heard, the ethical, the standards will go up, and for us, the future of finance will be rosier. And this is the last point. Okay, I realize that time drifts away. Uh, retirement security. We know we've already said more middle class, increased number of high net worth. This is a big topic. Okay? We know the demographics are changing. We know there'll be a lot of people retiring soon. And then there'll be those who are coming in. The question is, does the system allow them to it? Do they know how to do it? What's the best, in, uh, the, the best way forward? We're not in the business of saying, this is what you do but we are in the business of trying to get a discussion uh, around the place so that it's a discussion that is held and then the best decisions can be made. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I said it is focused on where I come from rather than from you know, academia uh, and I'll later on be very pleased to answer any questions I can revolving what we do. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. And our last panelist is Suk Hyun. Thank you for your uh, kind introduction, uh, uh, AJ. And yeah, I'm very pleased to join this great session as a panelist. And actually, this topic, the future of finance, is a very big topic to me. So I don't know how I prepare for my discussion, but uh, Professor Goh uh, kindly suggests me to make some presentation on the Asian bond market and uh, the, the renminbi internationalizations. So, uh, so I would like to talk about the Asia's response to, to financial crisis, Asian financial crisis and the global financial crisis and the, the future of the Asian bond market. And then uh, lastly, I briefly touch upon the uh, renminbi internationalizations, which the Chinese government is um, uh, pursuing. Yeah, uh, actually, I prepared uh, so many uh, slides for your understanding, but with a limited 
time. I skip some of my slides and uh, I skip uh, some uh, technical or detailed explanations. So I cover from Asian financial crisis to global financial crisis and uh, lastly I'll briefly explain the uh, renminbi internationalizations. So whenever the global uh, uh, financial crisis happens, the financial regulators uh, get together and they uh, discuss various uh, policy measures to strengthen financial regulations and real regulations and to prevent uh, from the recurrent uh, uh, crisis in the future. So there are so many international uh, financial forums at the global level and the regional level, but here, I just focus on the ASEAN Plus 3 process, and then I'll explain you know, briefly about the ASEAN, uh, ASEAN Plus 3 uh, Bond Market Forum. The ABMI Asian Bond Market Initiative was uh, endorsed by ASEAN Plus 3 governments in order to reduce the double mismatch problems, that is, uh, currency and the maturity mismatch problems, which is um, regarded as one of the main causes of Asian financial crisis. And this figure shows some the basic governance structures of um, ASEAN Plus 3 process and uh, Asian bond market initiative. And each uh, task force has its own the mandate and missions to develop further Asian bond market. For example, TF1, they are trying to promote the Asian local currency bond issuance, and TF2, facilitating more uh, local currency bond demand, and TF3, try to improve the regulatory framework. And under the TF3, uh, I will explain details more about ABMF. They are trying to standardize and harmonize uh, the regional the bond issuance and investment. And TF4, they discussed how to improve the uh, bond market infrastructures. And as the ABMI scope and activities have evolved over time, and ASEAN Plus 3 policymakers review the progress made under the ABMI framework, and modify its scope and activities as appropriate since its launch in 2003. So I summarized major progress of uh, Asian bond market initiatives for 10 years, actually uh, more than 10 years. And there are three big structural changes in 2003 and 2008 and 2012. So each time the ASEAN Plus 3 government, they are trying to propose new roadmap for uh, Asian bond market initiatives, and they are also discussing the how to build up common market infrastructures like uh, regional settlement intermediaries and regional credit, credit rating agencies and uh, kind of uh, information platform for the ASEAN Plus 3 multi-currency bond issuance framework. And this figure shows some um, the historical growth of ASEAN Plus 3 bond market, excluding Japan. As you see from these figures, uh, since 2003, the Asian bond market has substantially grown. But some government officials insist that this market growth has been driven by some regional initiatives like uh, ABMI, but we don't know. The ABMI has uh, really contributed to the Asian bond market growth and Asian bond market development. So I choose uh, two reasons for comparison, the ASEAN or ASEAN plus three and the Latin America. And uh, actually, those two regions are very similar uh, in terms of uh, its market size and public-private compositions of bond issuance and currency denomination of bond issues locally. 
And similarly, both markets lag behind those of uh, advanced uh, uh, markets. However, the difference is that Assam Plus 3 economies take the collective approach to develop and integrate their bond market on the regional platform, that is uh, ABMI, and they are pursuing harmonization, standardization of uh, different rules and regulations. Uh, however, Latin America economies take the uh, individual approach to develop their bond market to attract foreign investors and competing, competing each other with is uh, neighboring economies. So to reflect those facts, a uh, simply, uh, simple empirical model is set up for two regions and for two periods by uh, using difference in difference analysis method. And one region, Asia, is exposed to policy treatment ABMI in the second period, but not in the first period. And the other group is um, Latin America is not exposed to the treatment during either period. And I take out some, some uh, one of the major empirical results in my study and to show that our interest to the coefficient of uh, uh, interaction terms uh, in this equation. So it shows the, the interaction terms, so ASEAN plus three and ABMI uh, coefficient is uh, uh, statistically uh, significant. So I can interpret the, the ABMI has somehow the contributed to Asian bond market development uh, from the empirical perspective. So ABMI aims to utilize Asian savings for Asian uh, investment, and they try to mitigate the uh, currency and maturity mismatch problems in uh, the uh, structural uh, financial problems in Asia. And also, however, the government official and the central bankers only participate in the ABMI and a a ASEAN Plus 3 uh, process. So to induce more uh, private participation in ABMI discussions, the ASEAN Plus 3 bond market forum was established as a regional platform for public and private uh, participations. And they tried to standardize market practices and harmonization, harmonize uh, rule, rules and regulations, uh, especially relating to cross-border bond transactions in Asia. And ADB and uh, ADB, Asian Development Bank, as a secretary of our ABMF, they are trying to propose the ASEAN Plus 3 uh, multi-currency bond issuance framework, which uh, facilitates intra-regional transactions through standardized bond note and issuance and investment process. So currently, uh, financial regulators and central bankers and some of our uh, SROs, self-regulatory organizations and uh, market players, they are participating in the ASEAN Plus 3 Bond Market Forum. And it has uh, two soft forums, soft forum one and soft forum two. So for one, so for, in soft forum one, we usually discuss uh, the how to harmonize different rules and regulations in each bond market. And in so from two, they are discussing how to facilitate the harmonization of bond settlement infrastructures, especially for cross-border bond uh, investment. And then I'll discuss uh, what should change to further develop Asian bond market. Actually, the ABMI discussion moving toward the uh, uh, directions. At the initial stage of uh, ABMI, we usually focused on developing domestic bond market to circulate domestic savings uh, domestically. However, in terms of uh, utilizing Asian savings intra-regionally, we need to develop the cross-border bond market like uh, foreign bond market and like uh, the euro bond market. So we 
trying to propose kind of a cross-border interregional wholesale bond market where only professional investors can participate in. And also they are discussing to how to build up the regional uh, common market infrastructures like uh, RSI and uh, regional credit rating agencies and other information uh, portals. If you look at slide 18 and 19, uh, you can easily find out the cross-border bond issuance of strictly regulated Asian currencies is very limited and remains very small. So to facilitate more cross-border bond issuance and investment, we should lower or remove FX barriers because there are many Asian authorities still have maintained the strict FX control to minimize growing concerns that cross-border transactions of their local currency might destabilize their value of, uh, the value of their currencies. So Asian currencies' incompatibility in resulting from strict FX control and regulatory barriers between uh, countries in the region make them unsuitable for cross-border uh, transactions and strict FX control might deter the development of Asian FX market by restricting deliberative trading and cross-border transactions. And under these circumstances, currency mismatch problems which is one of the major causes of Asian financial crisis, cannot be addressed. And moreover, this restricts Asian efforts to facilitate further bond market development. And also, there are many uh, legal and institutional uh, impediments to, to cross-border transactions, like uh, yeah, different messaging format and different uh, security numbering and different uh, settlement cycles it impedes the cross-border uh, investment. And also, we have a yeah, different tax system, and some of our Asian countries, they still maintain the, the strict FX control. And in Korea also, they have uh, investor registration systems. So even if uh, foreign investors can want to invest in Korean bonds, they have to register to uh, Korean financial supervisory uh, services. And lastly, I briefly touch upon the currency internationalization, uh, especially focusing on uh, renminbis. The global financial crisis led to expectation about the emergence of a new international monetary system that adopts not only US dollars, but also other currencies such as the Euro and Chinese Yuan. However, the listen to the European debt crisis put a hold on to replacing the dollar while the chaos around the international monetary system escalated, China reformed its financial system, has taken gradual step to internationalize their currency, the yuan. However, although the Chinese is, China is pursuing RMB internationalizations, currency internationalization generally requires many free conditions. For example, a country should first meet certain uh, institutional threshold, the economic size, and the trading volumes. And I think uh, China uh, already met these uh, three conditions. But the development of a capital market and the financial openness is uh, uh, the remaining uh, and challenging issues for RMB internationalizations. Uh, this is uh, the major uh, the determinant for currency internationalizations. <laughs> And I also, by using order of the logic more than I calculated the probability of the currency internationalizations. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the examples. Uh, you can see yeah, in case of a uh, US dollar, it's a 99% for full currency internationalization. And uh, interesting is the Japanese yen. They have a very low uh, probability of uh, full currency internationalizations. Uh, in case of China, At the current level, they have a very low probability for full currency internationalization. But they have a comparatively uh, high probability of 
for uh, partial currency internationalization. And actually, although small economies like uh, uh, Australia and uh, New, New, New Zealand, they successfully international internationalized their currencies, although their economic size are very small. So, but they are uh, yeah, trying to develop the deep and liquid uh, capital market to internationalize their cap, uh, currencies. And by using the projection of GDP and the trade share in China, I did uh, some simple dynamic uh, simulations. If Chinese uh, take the gradual approach, maybe consider considerable time will be needed to successfully internationalize Chinese yuan. However, if, take, if Chinese government take some big bang approach, yeah, suddenly uh, open up their capital market or uh, liberalize a fully capital account, maybe their probability go up and they, they will yeah, catch up the euro and the US dollars around the 2023s. However, lesson from the Asian financial crisis and global financial crisis, Chinese government will likely adopt many convertibilities, many international, internationalized policies instead of a full uh, convertibilities. And it is expected that they will create a favorable regulatory framework to facilitate the free flow of uh, renminbi across the border. Uh, while they protect the Chinese economy from the risk of uh, uh, volatile capital flows. Uh, I explained briefly about the Asian uh, bond market and the uh, renminbi internationalization, and I think uh, those uh, movements will uh, change the future of uh, finance in Asia. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So we have a little bit of time for questions from the audience. Um, you can either have a general question, which we'll see if one or more of the panelists would like to respond to, or you can have a more specific question for a specific panelist. Yes. Yeah, uh, let me ask you some uh, the future of financial uh, career. In the finance industry, because in the past uh, there, when there there used to be a some firewall on uh, between the financial uh, intermediaries such as uh, investment banking and uh, just uh, conventional commercial banking and other kinds of uh, asset management companies, uh, when they are separate from each other, then actually that might send the signal to the market participants that at least there would not be a or any significant or serious uh, conflict of interest among the researchers because uh, especially about the proprietary trading members and the uh, trading teams has a very uh, direct conflict of interest between uh, the other kind of a broker or Western team or some other. So that might create a very bad signal since the establishment of the Grand Bridge Riot Act in 1997. So that would be a really serious problem that if you go back to the South and establish a firewall, does it create a, some problem to from the regulatory perspective, or rather it could send the, some positive signal to the market and uh, to the benefit of financial uh, jobs or financial positions in the financial industry. Do you want me to, do you want to take it? Um, you can start. I'll you can start and then you can. Well, I'd, I'd be happy to just say very briefly that uh, uh, We've seen for the last X years waves of regulation, deregulation, re-regulation along the lines of what you're talking about. Um, and and I, I, I think that uh, one, of the, one of the things that will promote 
uh, a deepening of the capital markets in countries like Korea and many in the Asia Pacific region uh, along the lines of what Suk was describing here uh, in, in Asia with the AB, uh, ABMI uh, is, is predictability and stability with respect to regulation. If we understood for the long haul the way in which rules are being written for the markets, then uh, I think uh, market participants would be able to move forward with greater confidence. The problem is that we have crises, the crises beget uncertainty about what we're doing and it leads to regulation and re-regulation that leads to probably further future instability. That's my take. Yeah, I, I don't need to add to that and I, I come back to you know, something I touched on when I was speaking and, and that's the element of trust. Um, our core constituency are the, the investment managers. Um, <coughs> Now there is a, obviously a big overlap between who actually takes the CFA qualification, and so you know, sort of the investment bankers, the intermediaries, they all see this as being you know the suitable qualification uh, for the industry. But the more that we can have a voice which is heard, and that's with the regulators as well, and the more I don't want this to sound too trite, but the more that we can actually embed an ethical view into everything then there will be less need to have heavy regulatory oversight, which everybody's trying to avoid and find ways of getting around that. So I think it really is, uh, and this is something from our organisation, you know, this is a long haul. You know, this isn't going to change tomorrow, it's not going to change the next day. But if we can get a louder voice and can get a seat at the table with regulators and actually get the, you know, a change within the industry, then I think some of those issues will disappear. That's our ambition, long term. And so would you like to add anything? You okay. We have another question. So I have a question that I think every panelist can probably probably does have an opinion about. And the the question is, what is your biggest fear for finance, financial markets, financial regulation? over the next five to 10 years? What, what would keep you up at night when you think about where we're going, what has been done, perhaps overreach, what hasn't been done, and attention? What do you lose sleep over? Um, okay, thanks, thanks Jack. Um, if I start, you know, I, I think and I, I've got an individual view, and then I've, if you know, I'm representing the CFA Institute as well. Um, it, it's the relevance and the rigor with which people entering into the industry are permitted to practice. And often the industry seems to want to race to the lowest standards. Sometimes regulators agree uh, that the lower standard is better. Uh, higher standards cost more money, they take more time. And so, you know, the threat to us, or as I think uh, the way I see it, is that less emphasis is placed on the education side. I think we've seen from some of the numbers, I'm not saying we're on a slippery slope, but unless something sort of hauls the industry up uh, by the bootstraps, then I think the idea of having somebody who's qualified can, be less, can become less relevant, which is why we think more about trying to imbue professionalism and having it seen as a profession. So I think the emphasis on a robust education, ethics-driven qualification and we set the standards quite high, and we're not going to reduce those standards, but we want to bring the rest of the world up. If they ignore us, that would be our biggest concern. I, I would echo the same thing, uh, Jack, but with a different, coming at it from a different angle, uh, which is that uh, as an educator in the field of finance, I worry about the fact that the marketplace somehow votes down the relevance of what we do uh, in the sense that uh, in, in the opinions of some, uh, the research that we're doing is not of relevance to, the, uh, to guide uh, the, the wisdom of the regulatory process as it goes forward, to, uh, to guide uh, deciding on what the best professional and ethical standards are for those who are participants. Uh, if, if, if we don't have uh, at, at the base of that the rigor of re research to guide those kind of decisions because we somehow judged it irrelevant and ancillary to the, the core of it, uh, that is a very worrying future for me. 
Uh, I happen to be very optimistic, uh, and, uh, 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 and I, guess, I guess I'm colored, but some of the coloring of, of that view uh, comes from uh, some of the reactions that we did see in the aftermath of the crisis, as I was relaying in my remarks uh, about, about uh, many in the media voting down what we were doing and sort of uh, judging it ex post as, as, as potentially relevant. It is not. It is not. And I, I sure as heck hope that it guides uh, uh, our friends who are professional organizations in defining the standards for the best practices. I hope it guides those who are in the regulatory uh, bodies deciding on what are the best steps to take towards deepening the bond markets in Asia and, and a myriad of other things that we do uh, in terms of industry. Yeah. yeah, thank you for your question. I think that the question is too big for me to answer. But uh, regarding the, the global standard or regulatory issues, such as uh, Basel III or uh, the systemically important financial uh, uh, institutions, all those uh, discussions uh, don't mainly from the perspective of the, the advanced countries, the, like the uh, US or the, the European countries. But I think uh, the, the financial market and capital market development is uh, very different from the, the advanced countries. So I think that the uh, Asian countries, they should raise more their voices and to reflect their uh, interest and their uh, situation into those uh, the international discussions. But Suk, do you agree, though you make a distinction between the developed and the emerging markets, you would agree that the basic principle is the same, that you want a strong, vibrant market in support of uh, the growth of these economies. Do you agree? Yeah, I, it's I, not I different. <laughs> yeah, I agree that the fundamental things, but the situation is uh, yeah, completely different from uh, the advanced countries. So yeah, to reflect that and the, the we should discuss together at the international uh, forums, like the uh, FSB and G20. There's, there's no question the remarks that you made about the importance of harmonization of these standards and rules uh, for uh, oversight uh, of the uh, clearance and settlement system of the bond. That is critical because it's naturally global, right? It's naturally global. So I, I definitely agree with that. Do we have, no, we've got about a minute or two left. Uh, does anybody else have another question? Doesn't look like it. I'd like to, to thank the panelists and I'd like to thank all of you for, for attending. Um, if we can, if you can join me in, in extending a warm thank you to all of them, I'd appreciate it. <laughs>